Hallelujah. Wow. Some of these comments were powerful. I was kind of, uh, I want to start with a little bit with Junior's verse. I think it's verse 12, right? And he says, Paul is encouraging us to work out our salvation. I think in the first place, in order to work out our salvation, one of the first things we have to have is the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ, as Jason was talking about, Donna talking, Donna was talking about having compassion, doing things out of uh, love for other people, and not for any, and Jason was saying it too, not for our own selfish benefit, you know? And uh, I think that is working out our salvation. There has been a maybe 800 year old debate between a group of people called the Calvinists and the other believers like Lutherans and so on, I think. They, they, the Calvinists argue that once you are saved, you are always saved. So you don't really need to fight up and fuss and do anything else. And that argument holds that somebody who is truly saved, you see, if I come up here and say a prayer because somebody called me, and my heart is not broken before God in repentance, and I am not looking towards God for my, and putting my trust in Him, I'm not truly saved. But somebody who is truly saved will behave saved. <laughs> okay, and those who are not truly saved, you will see for yourself the actions. So, the, some Baptist churches and so on, it's the interpretation of what one saved always says, because Jesus said, if you are in my hand, no man can pluck you out. You know, no man can take himself out of the hand of the Lord. So, I believe that when he says work out our salvation, I think that's a natural, a natural upshot, a natural consequence of, of us being saved. So I love those verses of scripture. And, uh, but, but going back to that, Junior, I think not the works will come out of a heart and a mind that is uh, like the mind of Christ. Now, I want to, Don was asking me a question, say, how, when we are coming in the car, how can somebody esteem another person higher than themselves? Practically, how is that possible? And I was thinking about it, and this thought came to me, I believe is from the Holy Spirit. You know, the reason why Jesus could put other people above himself yeah. and lay down his life for others was because when you own everything you know <laughs> like when you're in charge of everything you have no insecurity about yourself you understand that? you know when we when jesus christ the scriptures say he was equal with god and he didn't count it robbery it's like a, a, a like the rich the, the rich young guy who took his father's inheritance and went away and when he came back, the, the older brother, I remember Junior was saying this one time, the older brother was angry because the father was throwing a party and the father said to him, but man, everything I have here was yours. You could have a half party anytime you wanted, you know? So this older brother didn't quite understand what, what he had and who he was. He didn't understand any of those things. And that's why he could not feel good for his brother. He was insecure. He was insecure understanding because of his ignorance. But if we understand that Christ is living in us and that all things belong to us, listen to me, you know why it is, I think people can be generous to other people? Because they don't put their trust in the, the level of their bank account or how much money they have, but they see God as their bank. They see God as their provider. And so to give money or to give out of a need, to give like some people will give their last two dollars and they don't know where the other money is coming from. It is because their trust, they know who they are. And so practically, I think, we can esteem other people at least equal to us. <laughs> but the scripture is not saying. And so I was telling Don, if I see Jason, no, Jason's a bit younger than me. But if I can see the potential in Jason and say, wait a minute. If the things that I have could help me, but Jason needs it. Jason has, I could see more potential in Jason than I ever had. And I say, 
I said, Jason, take this thing that I have. It's, it's a precious thing. Take this. That is putting other people above ourselves by putting value. Like seeing the future of that person as more powerful than us. Praying for that, for that person. Speaking well of them. All those things I think are esteeming others highly and above ourselves. And if we have this mind in ourselves, then I think we will live in love as Jason was saying. I, I used to go to a big mega church. And I don't know if it's my spirit or my, I think it's my spirit and not my flesh. A guy used to come up and pray before the pastor came on. And every time he stood up on the pulpit, I would watch this. He would put his foot like this. And do like that while you're praying. Now, I don't, he's probably ignorant of that, you know. But it always struck me as, I think he's trying to show me his shoes. <laughs> oh, oh. He's just so confident in himself. It just came across to me like... And I saw it again in another big church. A guy came out to introduce a pastor and he was like... And then something about it was bothering me. And this scripture came to me tonight. If you could turn to me, to, with, turn with me. The Proverbs chapter 6, I think it is, and verse, my Bible is kind of moving slow with the internet, if anybody can find it before me, help me out. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, and verse 16, this is how serious God takes this matter, right? And I think it's verse 16 and, and continue to verse 17 if I'm not mistaken. Okay, I, I found it. It's alright, but I would like you to read it. And take a mic off. Can you take that mic off? Is it does that battery and stuff? Well, it's Sandra. I love you. I love you getting involved here. Leave these things, Lord, the Lord is. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and an that shed innocent blood. I, uh, I'm always amazed at the precision of God. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. You want to say anything about that? Don't worry about it later then. But uh, I'm always struck by the precision that God writes His word in. Now, this is a list of things that God hates. And I think a lying tongue is terrible. I think that a murder, somebody who's wanting to commit murder is absolute. I thought, I think that should be the. Where's that round in this? Where's hands that shed? Innocent blood comes still behind a lying tongue and a proud and arrogant look. Now, inside a man's heart, he might not be proud or arrogant, but can you imagine just the look, or the appearance? Oh my God, this is this is this is amazing. So, if you ever see me, brethren, looking proud, okay, just make sure you come and hit me. Hey, wake up, man. <laughs> just, just if. Give out the impression that I'm looking proud and arrogant. Just come and wake me up because it's a dangerous thing. God hates it. And uh, I hope this is not this is not being broadcast live. Yes. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, let me say this as gently as I can, okay? I have been in. Uh, let me. In seven years, I travel around this country, and every month we would be in four different churches, okay? So if I calculate 52 years, 52 weeks in a year, multiply by seven, give me an average. That's about 300 and something churches, maybe, okay? I've been to all kinds of churches, black, white, and all kinds of, and there's a complete difference in the way I see some things, okay? In the white churches, there may be pride and there may be arrogance, but the pastors don't usually walk around with their title in front of them, you know? Like you could call them, hey, Pete, how are you doing, man? You can walk by, hey! Pastor Pete, brother, so and so. People not hung up on titles. But boy, oh boy, oh boy. In our people's church, it's like, man, you have to go off on titles and go up, and everybody walks around with a kind of air. And, and this is what God thinks about this. 
Hey, people, all of us as humans can start off innocent, humble, and pure. But we need to get a little cloud and upside our head occasionally by the word of God, okay? Yes. And we need to wake up each other to walk in this holiness. So I think that humility, everything else about the life in Christ, this is one of my favorite scriptures. It, 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 and, and that is why in this church, if this church starts off innocent and pure, and eventually you see people strutting around inside here with titles and so on. Believe me, the Spirit of God, it could get as big as it wants. The Spirit of God cannot operate in this place. So, I believe that the people who are leading especially, have to understand what the mind of Christ is, demonstrate it. And you know, in those big churches, I noticed that people who want reverence, and they want to be lifted up, they get it from the people. The people actually like it. <laughs> and in churches, I notice in here sometimes, I notice it. That the people who behave, like we are trying, Russell and Claudia and I, we believe this with all our heart and dawn. And we try to model this. And some people sometimes would walk by or do things like out of total disrespect. I don't know if they know what they're doing or not. But, you know... <laughs> A man said, I was listening to this preacher, he said, he said, if you are leading and nobody is following, then you are just making steps, you know, there is no, no point in it at all. And so, I want you to honor something as a church. Honor people who walk humbly before God, because that is the height of spirituality and the depth of spirituality. And anybody who is claiming to be a title and higher than this and looking for rank and anarchy and looking for this kind of hierarchy kind of stuff, we got to be careful. we got to be very careful. This among you will be your servant. And that's why I walk out. I, I, I have no problem walking out in the back there and taking the trap to the dump. And the day I become too big to do that, that is, un, that is ungodly. And all of us inside here, the elders and so on, a lot of other people come here, they sweep, they clean, they do whatever. That is the mind of Christ. Never think that we are too high to do the lowest, most menial thing for our brethren. This is the mind of Christ. And out of that, I think that is working out our salvation. Hallelujah. You receive it? Amen. Hallelujah. Do not let that evil, wicked spirit of arrogance and pride ever enter into the midst of this church. When you see it and you spot it, <laughs> we need to deal with it. Okay? We will, we will deal with it. I have seen that here among our young people, some, some, some of our younger people, young in the Lord, you know. You know, when it's young and, you know, sometimes a little bit jealous and so on, have to be a little bit careful, you know. In, in the zeal, keep the mind of Christ in our midst. Hallelujah. What do you say, Sister Indian? Thank you. Oh, you want to say something? You want to give me an example? Put on the mic and tell me. So, the other day I was going to work. I was going to the bank, and then this lady asked me, where is the other bus, bus stop? And I said, across the street. And then she, she was like, okay, where? And then I was like, I don't want to miss the bus. So I was like, it's a question so you can just go there and get it so I just went so she did still anyways that's so why I went my way and then help her crush the street and then sort of sit down and then when I was coming back I was like I should have a camera right here so they know what I'm doing it's good and then <laughs> so I was like then God to me I was looking for him in stone phone this is a Mac you six I said if you do any people to see your um your treasure has already been rewarded so that would you can me from right there yeah yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, praise the lord where are we it's 816. uh i would like to to continue i think we, we would stay in this chapter for a few weeks. Is that how Russell usually does it? We we'll stay in a chapter for a week or two weeks? Or? One day. One day, okay. All right. Well, I was looking at the second half of this 
chapter. And the second half of the chapter is about interrelationships between Paul and the church and his disciples, the guys who helped him out, like Timothy and Epaphroditus, I think I'm pronouncing his name right. And he, Paul is trying to make a, a case that the church was lacking in support of him. They didn't care too much about him. He was in need, he was probably in prison, he was wherever, and he would never get the help that he needed, except for Timothy and for this guy who would lay down his life. The man almost died trying to help bring stuff to Paul. And so this, this, I, you, you try to think, well, how is this chapter kind of related? You know, and it is related to me in the fact that there were two men who, who esteemed Paul highly above themselves and the church kind of rejected him. The church that he, he lived for, he laid down his life for them, they didn't want to support him. And so this to me is an outward working, a working out of salvation of two men who decided to live like Christ and have the mind of Christ towards Paul. And so as we go out this for the rest of the week, let's think on these things. Let us treat. Is it possible? Uh, Destiny was talking about being the light of the world. Is it possible that we could esteem unsaved people in the same way, or is this only between Christians? What do you guys think? What, what do you, it doesn't say esteem Christians in church more highly than yourselves. No, uh, it, it's it's a general statement. Others, right? It means that. A man could be wicked as sin, like Saul, running down Christians, killing them, and yet God put Paul, Paul wrote, let me see if I have my facts correct, I think Paul wrote more than half of the New Testament Bible. So a man who was a terror of the church, the last person you think would be saved, was saved and put above. In the, in the scope of his work and his reach, Paul took the gospel to the entire Gentile world. So his, his, his power, the power of his message and the way God used him surpassed apostles who actually walked with Jesus. Therefore, when we meet an unsaved man, we do not understand, we can't tell the future, if that unsaved man is somebody that God is going to elevate in the house of God. And in his word. And therefore, we have the we, the we have the opportunity, we have the calling, we have the requirement that we should treat all men, all humans have the potential to be the next mighty son of God. I remember this preacher, this white preacher, living in a nice suburban area in Pennsylvania, rich, have leather shoes, nice car and everything. God told him, he said, I want you to leave all of this and go to New York. I'm going to Bronx. Uh, his name was, I can't remember his name. He started this big church in New York. So he went there, and the first day he parked up his car, he just walked around the corner and came back. All the help got the car. When he came back in about five minutes, the car was jacked up. The four wheels were gone. <laughs> and, he, and, and people said, you know what that stoop is? In New York, he's like sitting on the steps. They have these, these kind of apartment things. And all these young people just standing out there watching him. He said, well, <laughs> took my wheel this this is going to ride it eventually the Holy Spirit he saw a guy with no shoes that said I'm on the youths and the Holy Spirit take up, take off your shoes and give it to the guy Word bless young people took off his shoes gave it to the guy and that guy became his guide all through the Bronx he started to move among gangs okay and one of the Hispanic gangs, there used to be black gangs and Hispanic gangs and white gangs and so on. But one of the gangs was Hispanic. And to get inside this gang, you had to pass through all kind of rituals and so on to get to meet the head of the gang. The head of the gang was a guy called Nicky Cruz. Okay? That man, I probably, is with gang fights, baseball bats, guns, whatever. I think he might have killed several people in his time. And to get close to that guy, you had to be, you had to be really, really well trusted. And somehow this man, I think, and if I'm not mistaken, that one of these guys that the preacher helped, helped get him into a meeting with Nicky Cruz. 
And he preached the gospel to Nicky Cruz and Nicky Cruz said, don't let me ever see you around here again. I'll kill you. <laughs> so he even and set up some, some meeting with an animal arena and so on. And he was preaching out there somewhere in the Bronx and this guy walked, well, he saw the guy coming in with his gun. And the preacher was almost sure he was, this night he was going to die. And that man preached and called on God while he preaching. And guess who was the first person to come up and gave his life to the Lord? Nicky Cruz. That's, a movie was made of the that and a book written called The Cross and the Switchblade. Check it out sometime. And that guy became one of the, the biggest evangelists that ever. He, lead, he led his whole gang and think the Lord. And so when we're talking about esteeming each other high, more highly than ourselves, or esteeming, esteeming others more highly than ourselves, as, da, as Daniel, as Destiny was saying, sorry, all of these confuse me sometimes, but as Destiny was saying, if our light is shining, if we are walking in this humility, our light will shine. People will see it, they will feel it, they will feel the love of God, they will feel the compassion of God, and we will win them for Christ. Hallelujah. So let this mind, let's start with the person closest to us right now tonight, you know. Husband and wives, I want to encourage you. Okay, as Jason was saying, let us do things to edify the other person, to build up the other person, to esteem them like, you know, man, I love you so much. I will do whatever I can to, to see you get to your dream. What is your dream? What's your ambition? The person next to me is interested. And what did he say? Don't be interested in your own life, but be interested in the life of others. Yes. So I really take an interest in Jason. I mean, this is practical now. This is real. I, every time I see him, I say, Jason, you're a mighty man of God. <laughs> okay? You have gifts, you have talents, and what God is doing to you right now is kind of breaking you. You can't, nothing good can't come out of a vessel that's not broken, you know? It has to be broken. So be patient and be faithful. Great things are ahead for you, okay? Every time I receive it, and it's gonna happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.